Okay, some introductory remarks. So we decided that we will not go into the legal details because that would be going too far and you as the audience would not really benefit from it when we start to discuss uh, what a money service business is in the US as compared to a payment service provider in the EU. Um, we want to give you an overview of the regulatory landscape in the US and Europe and work out some of the major points that you should be aware of when you're doing your Bitcoin businesses. And uh, the entire discussion may be a little bit frustrating for you because we cannot give you clear-cut results because the regulatory la landscape is moving at the moment. So at the end, we will try to have a question and answer session so you can come up with specific answer, uh, questions and we come up with not so specific answers. <laughs> Um, as the regulatory situation is advanced in the U.S. as compared to the EU, I would like to ask uh, Patrick, as General Counsel of the Bitcoin Foundation, to give us a summary of the, th of the things that have happened in the U.S. and where uh, you stand. Just a quick summary? Yeah. Quick summary. Yeah, yeah. Start, at the beginning of time. start at the beginning of time. Okay, yeah. No. So. The, probably the most important thing that happened is FinCEN issued interpretive guidance around uh, de de decentralized convertible virtual currency. Uh, and that laid out an initial framework for how you should think about uh, uh, running a Bitcoin exchange. Um, and it set a, a standard that allowed venture capitalists and other investors to come in the space and feel secure that this is a legitimate currency and that this is, these are legitimate business opportunities. There's some challenges with the guidance and how it was actually issued and, and some of the, there's some tweaks to be made still with that, but um, generally that was a positive sign and it really moved things in the right direction and you could see it. I mean, the, 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 the volume, the transaction volume was picking up, adoption picked up, uh, the price moved, everything went up after that. Um, and that was, a, um, that, that was probably a, a, a watershed moment for the industry. Since then, there have been some other things. The CFTC has made some noise about the Commodities Future Trading Commission has made some noise about coming into the space, and, and some others have as well. And there's some noise about the FTC protecting consumers. And then, you know, most recently, uh, California and some other states have decided to uh, take, uh, you know, the consumer protection uh, issues up. And uh, so, you know, maybe we can consider it the next watershed moment uh, when uh, the Bitcoin Foundation received their... Uh, <laughs> non-cease and desist letter from the, uh, the, the California Department of Financial Institutions. Um, we've, we've actually just issued our response back um, and we hope to make that public very soon so everybody can read uh, how that correspondence is going. What we laid out for them was, you know, we don't think that, you know, as a foundation where <laughs> these laws apply to us. Um, we kind of laid out what we believe that the law was and should be. Uh, and we asked them for a letter opinion on whether selling bitcoins directly to consumers constitutes money transmission and needs a license. So they don't have to respond to that, but it puts the issue out there for them. And you can take that however you like. Okay, thanks, Daniel. Um, anything from the other panelists to add to that summary? Well, I think, uh, you know, Patrick's in the, in the thick of it now, but uh, one problem that we have in the States is that although the Department of Treasury came out and uh, sort of clarified things, now we're at a state-by-state -state level. And we've seen the first state, California, be somewhat aggressive, and there are a few other states who will also be aggressive. So as far as a state-by-state -state analysis, uh, time will tell, and I expect we'll see future uh, confusion as we've seen so far. And um, I actually, uh, shortly following the um, Bitcoin San Jose conference, which I think was another watershed moment in some ways, because you could see this critical mass forming and for the first time. You know, this wasn't kind of this fringe hacker technologist movement. It became something that was actually viable as a business and something that important stakeholders in our country and, and globally could really buy into. And so, you know, one, as Patrick mentioned, you know, one of the, the um, uh, positives of the FinCEN, few as they are, um, of the guidance was that they, in fact, acknowledged and legitimized Bitcoin as a medium of exchange. 
And so that was actually, that helped kind of propel it from kind of the shadow world into, um, you know, the global financial market. And so during my, so, I, so, so following after the conference, I um, met with, I had the opportunity to meet with Treasury, including representatives of FinCEN. And we talked about some of our initiatives in the space. You know, we brought up this issue of federal preemption, for example. You know, the fact that, you know, you have to be registered on the, the federal level, but then on the state level, you have to go to 50 different regulatory bodies in different states in the United States. And, you know, some of these in some of the smaller states, you know, barely know how to use a computer. <laughs> and so to explain Bitcoin, you know, piecemeal to one regulator after another is just, you know, it just really is an insurmountable effort in some ways. So we brought that issue up to Treasury and really their, their, um, their response was typical. Um, I think they said, you know, that the 50 state, the state federal system is just a fact of life in the United States and that it's up to us as an industry to survive these barriers to entry. And, you know, another, um, you know, another really interesting issue that came up in Treasury was that, um, you know, they, they kept on asking this question over and over again in various forms. And the question was, you know, we thought Bitcoin was an outlier, and now we're seeing all these other virtual currencies coming up. Um, Ripple, for example, you know, why are these emerging payments coming out? You know, why is the exist existing system not sufficient? And so it kind of betrayed a, a fundamental misunderstanding about the incredible potential of Bitcoin, if not as a unit of exchange, as an electronic network that provides secure, instantaneous global transfer. And you know, that was a point that actually did resonate with Treasury. And we, at that time, you know, Patrick and I had talked about um, forming a broad industry coalition. So instead of each business trying to talk to regulators in a piecemeal fashion, to really form a cohesive group um, that could actually carry some weight and um, create some institutional changes on the state and federal level. So, um, you know, Patrick and I have been talking about this coalition and, you know, on our end in California, we've been, um, and, and, you know, actually after the Bitcoin conference, we had people coming up to both of us, you know, asking how they could join this effort. And it became very clear that, you know, all of us are very interested in seeing this, this industry survive. So, you know, on, on our end, we've been uh, forming a self-regulatory organization and we have the full blessing of Treasury. You know, this is really a way for us to build a standards body that actually addresses the way our technology works and the real risks that are posed rather than a reaction to perceived risks. So, you know, we've, we've made a lot of efforts on this front um, and I, uh, I'd be happy to share more details about that. But it is in the works. We're having a meeting of people who are interested in forming compliant, um, you know, sophisticated businesses to join and make a public statement. Um, in July, we have recruited some pretty heavy hitters to join the board as an independent board of directors. And we are looking to form some sort of standards by the end of the summer. So regulators in the United States do not really have an integrated approach to the matter? No. And they still need to learn about this? So, and so. they sort of shifted the burden of regulation to the industry, which has formed a self-regulatory body now. Is that a summary so, of the summary? I, I would say so. And so often when I talk about the U.S. market, and you know, since we're in London, we shouldn't just focus too much on the U.S. only, although it's a very important market and it has a long reach out into the, to the world broadly. Um, but it, 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 I refer to the U.S. as a payment technology backwater, and it's mainly because of this issue. When you deal with the U.S., you're not dealing with one country, you're dealing with 49, right? The FinCEN and 48 states that all have Department of Financial Institutions, Department of Financial Services, their own parochial rules and laws and, and ways of enforcing their actions, whether it's cease and desist letters or 10-day letters or informal inquiries. There's a number of different mechanisms they use, but they do shift the burden back onto the industry to prove their innocence. Um, rather than actually creating an evidentiary basis for action first. So that, that's, that's something that you have to be wary of when you enter the U.S. market. And while that's not great for U.S. companies and it's not great for consumers in the U.S. who don't have necessarily access to fast-performant liquid exchanges because 
there are these huge barriers to entry, it is an opportunity globally for other countries to take a lead. Um, and I think that there are a lot of other countries looking at this right now. Stu can speak to Canada, but FinTrack has said, you know, we, they're blessing the idea of a Bitcoin exchange and not having these, these, these high barriers to entry. So I, I would look at it as, you know, as anything, both a challenge and an opportunity as well. So um, since we're in London again, the challenge is to find those countries that are, uh, that are friendly, um, like Panama, <laughs> maybe, uh, and, uh, and, and work there and maybe build inroads back into the U.S. if it, if it comes to that. Really Canada, Canada would, yeah, is, is that okay for summarizing the U.S.? Okay, uh, because Canada would have been the next question that I would have asked us to. Uh, there was this amazing statement by Fintrack saying that exchanges are not regulated, go ahead, do what you want. Could you, could you give us an idea of what the regulators in Canada, what their background is? Is it really as easygoing as it, as it appears? Um. Yeah, lawyers don't like unequivocal answers, so yes and no. Um, uh, FinTrack, since the San Jose conference, uh, has made statements, uh, not in the form of guidance, unfortunately, or even the form of you know, a, a presser, but there have been letters issued to several of the um, Bitcoin exchanges in Canada saying that FinTrack takes the view that under the Proceeds of Crime, Money Laundering, and Terrorist Financing Act, Canada. Um, Bitcoin is not funds within the meaning of that statute. Accordingly, they will not be regulated as money services business businesses um, when it's Bitcoin in, Canadian dollars out, or vice versa. Um, so there are a few caveats to that. One is that other currencies, other foreign exchange, and by that I mean other fiat money, non-Canadian fiat money like U.S. dollars or euros, Will be, will be caught because those are funds. The other is that um, other laws are still going to apply. So while it may not be funds, Bitcoin is indubitably proceeds under the criminal code, and smart exchanges will um, do what they need to do to vet people under the money laundering provisions under the criminal code. Um, and uh, the I think maybe the most important caveat is that I think FinTrack is going to change the rules. They're going to change the regs either sua sponte or in response to pressure from the FATF or its members. Um, so there, I think there's a window. I don't know how big or long that window is going to be, but uh, I, I think those are going to change, which might not be such a bad thing. I mean, in Canada, then you're still dealing with FinTrack if they choose to regulate on those models. Um, as well as one other province, uh, the province of Quebec has a Money Services Business Act. So it might still be an attractive uh, kind of place if FinTrack does change the regs. I promised you frustration. We're already into it. We have different legal approaches in the United States and even the situation in Canada is not as pleasant as it looked in the media where it just said, FinTrack said, exchanges are okay, is a little bit more complicated, I understand. And another point that we should work out is that most of these statements so far have been about Bitcoin exchanges. But of course, there's other players in the market. There's the users, there's miners, there's wallets, there's mixers. There's people who are dealing with derivatives, there's stock exchanges, there's funds. So, I mean, we could go through one after the other if we're very fast. Users, I think, is quite simple. Not regulated anywhere. You can use Bitcoins. Patrick is twitching a little. You don't know, right? I think that that's a little bit up in the air uh, mm. based on FinCEN's guidance. Depend that you, whether you're a user or an exchanger is, you know, not always a. It's a. It's a fine distinction sometimes, and that's unfortunate. And that's a tweak that we can discuss. No, um, not too many legal details. No, not too many legal details. I think there's like a quick fix to the guidance, and the quick fix is you just say, if you, it, they say that if you, it, it, a user who changes Bitcoin to cash engaged in a, as a business, is an exchange, right? And therefore, they're a money service business. 
So the simple fix to the guidance to remove uncertainty about that is just to say, as a user, if you're going through an exchange, you're never an exchange. If you're going through a financial institution in exchange, you yourself are not an exchange. And this helps miners as well, and I'm jumping the gun on miners. But miners were called out specifically in that guidance, and it created a real ripple effect and a, and a chilling effect amongst the miners, because now there's a worry about, well, just because I set up an ASIC rig in my basement, now I'm a financial institution? That's crazy. And it's obviously crazy, and it's just they didn't get it, and that's OK. We'll fix it. But one way to do that is to just say, whenever you go through a regulated financial institution, you yourself are not an exchange. That's not, that's not such a big ask, right? And the other is to just set a de minimis level. If you're transacting less than 1,000 USD, whatever currency, a day, you're not engaged in the business of transacting uh, uh, in exchanging, right? And so you're not an MSB yourself. These are like little simple tweaks, and you know, hopefully somebody from FinCEN is listening, right? And they can, we can engage them and talk about that, and we'll, we'll have those conversations at Treasury as well. But, um, Stock exchanges based on bitcoins, another problem, I guess. There is some Ampex, there's Bitfund, they are doing business on the internet. I guess it's not regulated yet, but we can expect regulation because trading securities on the internet just like that does not really work. Uh, I guess the situation for derivatives is kind of like similar, also there's a great OTC market for derivatives in the traditional financial system. But I'm also aware that the European, the EU is at the moment discussing, and I think in the US too, to regulate the derivatives OTC market. We have the funds. Uh, I know that there may be somebody in the audience from Switzerland who wanted to start a fund. I came across his blog the other day and he talked to his lawyer and the lawyer explained him what it means to set up a fund in Switzerland. And I don't know whether he's still going on with the project, but it's quite difficult. Also, one should say that this is not specifically a Bitcoin problem. This is a, this is a fund problem. Also, with securities, not necessarily a specific Bitcoin problem. It's a securities problem. Yes, any time uh, securities are sold, uh, it raises an additional level of regulation that's really not uh, central to Bitcoin. Uh, but I did want to comment on what Patrick said. Uh, there's nothing wrong with being a user of Bitcoin. Uh, there's no law in any country that I know of that prohibits the use of Bitcoin. Uh, Patrick's brought up a t uh, issue, a potential issue, if you exchange Bitcoin into fiat currency. But as far as a user is concerned, there, there's no problem. Uh, in addition, if you're a merchant and you accept Bitcoin for goods or services, there's nothing prohibiting that either. So uh, I did just wanted to clarify that you know that on one one end of the spectrum, there's uh, sort of a safe harbor for users and merchants, and uh, I think that's going to help the you know Bitcoin community flourish. As far as actually converting the currency, that it, that creates a problem. Uh, but uh, it's one that will be solved ultimately when there are licensed exchanges to deal with that. So in the States, uh, we are in this money transmitter land only because there are no banks that have yet accepted Bitcoin. Uh, once a bank accepts Bitcoin, that will apply across the whole country and you don't have to worry about a state-by-state -state analysis. So this uh, issue with exchanging is a issue we're dealing with now because we're a young industry, but it's one that's going to be solved. So, and I would add that uh, one it, to to reiterate Dan's point about being a user. I've personally never bought a Bitcoin, and I've never sold a Bitcoin. I've only earned them and spent them, and that's it. Um, and uh, and I'd like to spend more. So please, you know, <laughs> merchants, pick it up. Um, and that you're, you're absolutely correct. That is a safe harbor, as it were. You, you don't have to worry about any issues there. So as a summary, we have the problem with the uh, exchanges that it has been taken up uh, by the regulators already. But those who want to do securities exchanges, trade derivatives, set up funds, uh, they must be aware that there is regulation in the background. Maybe not specific Bitcoin regulation, but general regulation. 
And of course, uh, setting up ATMs for Bitcoins is probably regulated too. There's an ATM machine in the other room. Uh, be prepared to, to, to come within the scope of regulation as well with the ATM machines. Uh, I would say that sums up the situation in North America. So shall we move over to Europe then? Yes, I, I just did want to make a comment on the miners. I know that some lawyers have interpreted the guidance to uh, really put the miners in jeopardy. Uh, in my opinion, if you read that uh, closely, I don't think that FinCEN is targeting the miners in any way. And uh, when they talked about people creating currency, they were not talking about miners. They were talking about the original central administrator that issued the currency. So uh, there's a little confusion there, but I don't think that there's any, uh, at least I haven't seen any U.S. enforcement on miners yet. Uh, Europe. Anybody want to take on Europe here? Uh, ah, well. great. <laughs> <laughs> I, will, I will volunteer for this one. Um, Payword is a, is, a, is a global company, and so we have been in meetings with regulators all around the globe. And it's been hard work. It's been educating people, um, really one individual at a time, one regulatory body at a time. And what you're seeing is that because this is a young industry, because the laws are slow, and usually the ones that come out are pretty reactionary in terms of disruptive technologies like Bitcoin, you know, you're really seeing these um, competing regulatory regimes and competing land grabs for jurisdiction. So you really see, you know, we touched on this a little bit, but the reason why we're in money land in the United States is because, you know, there are several buckets and labels that we can put to mediums of exchange. We could call it money. We can call it a commodity. We can call it a security. We can call it a payment instrument, you know, a money order, a, a check. Um, so there are all these different labels that we could put on Bitcoin. And, and the way the law works, um, unfortunately, is by analogy, which sometimes doesn't translate very well for things that, um, that don't, don't analogize. <laughs> so uh, what you're really seeing is in the United States, they have carefully said that Bitcoin is not money. However, it belongs in the money bucket because it acts like money. So we're being treated and regulated. Um, Bitcoin is being treated and regulated as money in the United States. In the EU, um, this is not the case. Um, the UK um, FCA has come out and said that um, they don't consider Bitcoin money or e-money, and this is a view that is shared by the European Commission. And actually, you know, a, a lot of times the, the European Central Bank, it's, it's not exactly a trailblazer. They're known as being very conservative. And if you look at their virtual currency study, their white paper that came out in October of 2012, you can see that it's actually a pretty reasoned opinion. You know, they say, Here's, here are two case studies. You have you know, a decentralized system, you have a centralized system, you know, Linden dollars and Bitcoin. Here's the way it works. Here's how we see the regula current regulations um, bearing on these two different form, new forms of virtual currencies. And it's largely unregulated now. There are certain risks. And let's wait and see. And let's deal with the risks when we know what the risks are. So you see there's, there's a little bit more of a recent approach in the EU. And, um, you know, I, there was a SWIFT conference um, in, in Belgium just shortly following the, the Bitcoin conference. And at that conference, they had this huge eight-foot screen, I believe, where they showed the live transaction feeds of Bitcoin transactions. And, you know, it's, and I, 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 from what I recall of the, of the article that I wrote, read, the United States is really five years behind the EU in payments innovations. So, you know, you really can see that because this is a new, um, because these are new regulatory regimes, like Patrick said, there are a lot, there's a lot of room right now to make <coughs> some reasoned arguments about which regulatory framework it should fit in and what kind of rules should apply to a technology like Bitcoin. So, um, so really, you know, this, this idea of getting out a consistent narrative that we can that we can use with regulators to properly show them you know, where our businesses belong, how they should be regulated, how we are addressing consumer protection issues, privacy issues, um, you know, financial fraud issues, AML, terrorist financing issues. Um, you know, these are all things that we can address, but we, we need to do that in a cohesive way, and we need to be able to present that to regulators in a way that they'll understand. 
Yeah, and I would follow up on that. I think that's an excellent point. Um, and I've talked a little bit about how, as a community, we need to come together and really think about what are the things about Bitcoin that we can maybe give a little, and where are the lines in the sand that we have to draw and fight for, right? So what are those things? Is financial privacy a line in this? To me, it is. It's a line in the sand that says, that's something that's worth fighting for, right? Decentralization, that's something that's worth fighting for, right? And there's some other things that maybe we can give a little, like can, do exchanges have to run the four pillars of AML, KYC? Yeah, we can give on that, right? There's going to be an intersection between traditional finance and, and, and this new economy. And, and at that point, yes, we can maybe give a little ground there. But, uh, but some of the other elements, we need to come together and say, you know, here's where we can give, here's where we fight. Um, and I think that's really important. Come together means that you're recommending that uh, Europeans uh, set up an organization similar to the Bitcoin, Bitcoin Foundation in the US, self-regulatory maybe to approach uh, regulators uh, as a community and not as single and rather small startup companies and educate them about bitcoins and also discuss how to deal with it yeah so ac actually it's a great point thanks for the softball um <laughs> the uh bitcoin foundation is setting up local chapters right now all across the globe so if you're in a country that where there isn't a local chapter that's being set up right now and you're interested in uh in, in helping to organize and run one then Please come talk to me. Talk to uh, to John John Matonis, who's who's heading up that initiative for us on the foundation. Um, it, it's it's that kind of grassroots from the bottom up approach to handling these issues, uh, where we can come together and make a big impact. Not just in the U.S., not just in the EU, everywhere. Argentina, the Netherlands, the U.K. That's how we need to approach this issue. But again, having these conversations about you know, w what are we willing to fight for and what are we willing to give on? That's a very important first step in all of that. Okay, I hope this was heard by the audience. Uh, assuming that the majority of the audience is from Europe, I think I should make some remarks about the regulatory situation in Europe. Um, as Constance already mentioned, there's the analysis by the ECB. Um, what you have to, what you must have on in your mind when when thinking about bitcoins in a legal context in Europe is always e-money and the payment service directive. Directive means it's a law on the EU level which needs to be transformed into national laws, which has been done in most of the EU countries. Um, the ECB analyzed bitcoins and came to the conclusion it is not e-money and therefore the payment service directive is not applicable. That means as a result it's basically unregulated at the moment. Then I'm very grateful to the Bitcoin magazine because last week they published a summary of regulatory uh, comments of the last year and they also um, published them September last year covering the month before. And summarizing these summaries, there's not a lot of statements in Europe about Bitcoins. Uh, the regulatory authority in Norway gave a short explanation of how it works and says it's outside of the control of governments and it's risky. Okay. Um, there was a Finnish politician on TV who was asked by the moderator whether bitcoins are illegal and he said no, doesn't get us anywhere either. Uh, there's a lot of statements by various uh, organizations which are involved in the security area and they always come back to AML, anti-money laundering. This is another issue that you must have in mind. I understand that regulation in the US was to a large extent about anti-money laundering as well, and this will happen in Europe, I'm quite sure, because anti-money laundering has to do with organized crime, it has to do with terrorism finance, it means know your customers, it means keeping records of the transactions, and it means reporting to certain authorities. That you know, to, to follow, just because there hasn't been any official statements or 
you know, public statements, at least, from the regulatory bodies in the EU. Um, you know, on the institutional level, we're dealing with um, AML and KYC requirements of financial institutions for people that we, institutions that we bank with abroad. So, you know, on that banking level, the banks are going to require any, any business that signs up for a merchant account to have KYC and AML policies in place for the clients they onboard because they ultimately become clients of the bank. So, you know, we have, um, you know, we have the institutional level that also needs education, we, that also needs to understand the policies that we're putting into place that make them feel comfortable with us as a part of the financial market. And then we have, you know, the regulatory issues. So, you know, those things, you know, work in tandem, but separately. So, and it's interesting you bring that point up because I, I, I often make uh, the point that you, you, you can make your uh, your best friends over common enemies, right? And so while we, you know, talk about the banks and everything, one thing that would really help both the banks out and the Bitcoin companies out would be some sort of safe harbor provisions, right? That say, if you follow the four pillars of AML KYC and you do it in good faith, there is no criminal liability, upstream or downstream, right? So if the banks could have confidence that they can bring an exchange online and they, one bad customer on that exchange doesn't open them up to huge civil fines and criminal liability, that would just ease all this chilling effect that's happening right now through the banking industry. So, you know, working with banks, working with these institutional players, educating them, yes, but also finding common ground where we can both work together to solve common problems. I think that's a very, very important approach. You know, this is not a new concept in, in technology law. You have the DMCA, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, and, you know, that was kind of a response to the fact that the laws couldn't address what the technology did and couldn't address um, user behavior, which um, was modeled on what could be done. So, you know, you had these safe harbor provisions that came out as a way of shielding, you know, online service providers. that merely provided a platform on which users could conduct their business, entertain themselves on the internet, which is essentially a free system. So, so really it allowed um, you know, businesses like YouTube to survive and that, that we really need those sorts of um, reasonable policies applied in the Bitcoin context, which is kind of why we're, you know, we've really been working hard on having this self-regulatory organization so it becomes a body um, by which we can you know, we can propose safe harbor rules, we can propose de minimis amounts, we can, you know, give Washington and give regulators around the globe the kind of safety and comfort that they, that they really need to, to be able to embrace this kind of technology. I'll, I'll pick up the thread. One more point on that. I, I agree wholeheartedly with Patrick's comment about not making AML a line in the sand. Um, coming from the gaming sector, I know for a fact that you can, and there's been a lot of gnashing of teeth about how AML CTF requirements can be fulfilled in a Bitcoin environment. And I know for a fact in the gaming space, in the online gaming space, that you can, with a little bit of thought and some effort, um, looking at, stepping back and looking at your AML CTF requirements as a whole, you can accommodate Bitcoin within that environment. Um, it's not to say that Bitcoin itself can be regulated, because I don't think it can. But actors in that space that are conforming to their AML CTF rules and policies and procedures set down by the regulators, um, they can accommodate a Bitcoin, um, Bitcoin denominations within, the, within that framework. Thanks, Stuart. Before we leave Europe and take a quick look at some other jurisdictions, I want to get back to one more statement from a European regulatory body, which is the German Regulatory Authority. Uh, the German abbreviation is BaFin. And uh, here I have to criticize Bitcoin Magazine because your summary doesn't hold. Um, and if you read German and if you're a lawyer and you are aware that this statement was very carefully drafted. The wording is very subtle. So what Boffin is saying, first, they analyzed the e-money regulation that the ECB also analyzed, and they come to the same conclusion that uh, Bitcoins are no e-money. 
then the next step is they refer to bitcoins as unit of value. I go a little bit deeper into this because really I regard it as a very significant statement that at least the European players should be aware of and it's quite explosive as well. So they refer to bitcoins as, as units of values that is not units of accounts. Units of accounts is a technical term. Units of value doesn't mean anything but Contrary to the ECB, which more or less said, all right, payment service directive is not applicable, the BaFin, the German authority, as I say, very carefully drafted, says, insofar, however, only the creation of such units in value and their use as medium of payment are free. Means that other uses of bitcoins may be regulated. And in the next sentence, Boffin opens the back door and says, if, however, such units of value, bitcoins themselves, become an object of trade, that is, if bitcoins are traded themselves, don't ask me what that really means. I don't know. I'm a lawyer. And, and Boffin kept it vague. They want to keep it vague. But they say, if bitcoins are used as an object of trade, such transactions, in accordance with their structure, it's another backdoor, maybe banking transaction or financial service transactions. What Boffin does on a more abstract level is they want to look at the structure of the transaction that you are doing and then they decide this may be a banking transaction or this may be financial services which, may, which would bring the entire shebang of financial regulation in Europe down on you. All right, confusion on a higher level. All I'm saying is Boffin is, and Boffin is a very powerful authority in, in Europe, Germany and uh, the UK, I would say, are the most powerful regulatory bodies in Europe. And Boffin took a very close look at it and they're thinking very hard about what they should do. And they thinking about banking regulation and financial service regulation, which would, would make Bitcoin operations in Europe very costly, very complicated. But it depends on the structure of the transaction. And now back to what, what the other panelists say. There is an opportunity to go to Boffin and to talk to Boffin. You know, not as a single company. If a small startup company wants to set up an appointment with Boffin, maybe you get the appointment, maybe you can talk to these guys. But you're not really in a position to discuss Bitcoin operations with regard to banking regulation, financial service regulation on a European level with an authority like that. And if Boffin, which I think well, which I'm certain they are doing already. They're discussing this on a European level, which means Brussels is somehow involved in the background already. There is things in the making. Okay, now let's leave Europe because there's constantly the question which could be other interesting jurisdiction for Bitcoin operations. I call this competitive regulation and ask the question to the panel. Um, my understanding is that Austrac, they have more specific rules down there, and they have actually concluded that Bitcoin it does not fall within their definition of you know, key currency, or they have, a, they have a law in the books actually specifically addressing this a few years ago. So um, maybe somewhat like Canada to the extent that Austrac, which is their FIU, is taking a bit of a hands-off approach, but I would say, I would expect several of the same caveats to apply. Look at other laws, um, potential securities, uh, FI rules, that kind of thing. Um, and, it, and that might be narrowly ta tailored to you know, just Australian dollar, Bitcoin transactions and vice versa. So I think that um, when you analyze this issue, um, you're gonna have to do it on a case by case basis, based, basically depending on what your business model is, your funds flow, things like that. There are many businesses, by the way, we've talked a lot about these financial regulations. There are many, many businesses to be built that have, will never touch these, right? And I often talk about the three waves of innovation in Bitcoin that have happened so far. There's the first wave, the pioneers, many of whom took arrows and some of whom have survived. Um, and then there's the second wave, and we're seeing that play out now, which is the infrastructure plays, the mining, the storage, wallets, merchant payment processors, 
uh, and the exchanges, of course. And, you know, that is red ocean, right? That's, there's not a lot of opportunity left in that space. Um, and, and where there is, it's maybe not even the most attractive place to be because of all the regulatory hurdles and the hoops you have to jump through. Uh, it, it's in the Wave 3 space that if you're an entrepreneur right now sitting on the sidelines and you want to get into the space, the Wave 3 is imagine a world where all of those infrastructure plays are built. There is a fast performing exchange and merchant services work. What kind of consumer services or business to business services would you build on top of this network? Those are the plays right now that make a lot of sense. Um, those are very fundable opportunities at this moment. Um, and there are a lot of seasoned entrepreneurs looking at just those types of plays that are coming into the space. And it's those things that are going to cross the chasm for us to mass adoption. And once we have mass adoption of 50 million users, it's a totally different conversation that you have with regulators. Right? When you have a, a billion dollar market cap and a user base in the hundreds of thousands, maybe a little more, it's a totally different conversation. Um, and I'm, I'm frankly heartened at the, the, the level of discourse that I've been able to have and Constance has been able to have with, with the regulators. Um, usually they would just totally ignore this or you know, just create rules on their own. Um, but, but they've been very responsive. But when you're looking at a jurisdiction, understand your business model first and then just walk through a matrix. You know, is, what's the regulatory environment? What's the tax climate for your business? Right? What's the brand equity of being in a certain location? Right? Is Singapore a good thing or a bad thing? Uh, and where, what markets are you targeting? Are you targeting the US market or are you ignoring it? Uh, and where are you going to have offices? Right? And where's your headquarters going to be? Where's your team? So, so if you walk through those like five points, you can usually come to a good determination of what is a favorable dur jurisdiction for you. And, you know, again, you know, in a lot of these smaller countries, you deal with regulatory bodies that are less sophisticated and perhaps don't have as much familiarity with Bitcoin. So, you know, it's both an opportunity and, and a barrier, which is, you know, one, you can make your case, and, or two, um, they, can, um, they, can, they can reject Bitcoin as, as a viable business. So you really have that opportunity to have that conversation in some of these smaller countries. Now, it's not going to help you in the U.S. In the U.S., you know, if you serve any U.S. customers, it doesn't matter where you are. And so the U.S. market remains very restricted and very closed to people who are compliant. You know, I can tell you, you know, in, in Treasury's defense, they have, um, they have said that they're not opposed to innovation. Um, you know, of course, <laughs> you can take that. <laughs> they said they're not opposed to innovation, but it's really up to us as an industry to survive the current regulations. And that... There are no special rules that are going to be made until we're relevant enough to make special rules for. So that's where building that ecosystem and building coalitions, um, you know, joining the SRO, joining the Bitcoin Foundation chapters, that's where we'll be able to have stronger clout and stronger voice and be able to have, um, to be able to convince regulators on, on our own industry level how we should be treated, what categories apply, um, and what kind of policies we really need to have in place. That's absolutely right. And you asked, do I believe him? And the, the answer is yes, I do believe in some of this. I've met the director. I've looked her in the eyes. And, uh, and her reputation stands, in my opinion. She's a straight shooter. But she's also a tenacious bulldog. If you're in her sight, she's going to come get you because she's a prosecutor. Um, so you have to balance those two things. And I, I think that that... So when, when you have the director of FinCEN saying that I'm not targeting a particular industry, I think that's absolutely correct. But as a prosecutor, if she steps on a few people along the way to get her target, then that might happen. So you just have to be cognizant of these things. Okay. You know, lesson being stay out of the crosshairs. Okay, before we move on to the uh, question and answer session, I got to make a little advertisement for Switzerland as well. Um, <laughs> because the term self-regulatory already sh came up in the, in the discussion a couple of times. And if you go to the webpage of the Swiss regulatory body, fin, uh, FINMA, and you click on regulation, there's a pull-down menu which says banking regulation, insurance regulation, et cetera, PP, and then it says self-regulation. Because self-regulation is an integral part of the Swiss regulatory system. You can uh, set up an organization that sets up standards like best practice. You can discuss this with the Swiss uh, financial authority and they accept it. And in addition, Switzerland is a traditional land of banking and it's one of the countries on this planet 
which fought the hardest for banking privacy, in particular against the U.S., as we all know, right? <laughs> right. Okay, anything to add from, from you guys here on the panel, or should we move to Daniel? Just, just as a final sure. note, and we touched on it, and Stu is sort of an expert in this area, is that with all these Bitcoin transactions, wherever you're operating, there are tax issues associated with it. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Yeah, but... That's a good point. Think international. You can be in London these days. You can have a company in Hong Kong. You can have your service in Russia if you really want to. And you can transact globally. Think international. The internet is boundless. But to, but to Patrick's point on the tax side, that's a very fluid. This whole matrix concept is very useful, but it's always fluid and fact specific. So one business model might have a completely different makeup in that matrix than another. And tax may be at the top of the list, or it may be almost an afterthought, so. Okay. Yeah, and I would say that um, just in general, yeah, sorry. Okay, one last, last comment, right? Um, I, I think we talk a lot when we talk about regulation about the law enforcement side of things, and we haven't touched on the consumer issues at all. Um, and law enforcement is right now driving this issue, and responding to law enforcement in a proactive way is very important. But we have to make sure we're not letting the tail wag the dog a bit, right? There are other agencies and there are other people in government who, are, who, who want to have a say in this. Uh, and sometimes they don't always appreciate the law enforcement side taking the lead on these conversations, right? I mean, at no point have I you know, heard anybody in law enforcement talk about the fact that Bitcoin puts financial privacy back in the hands of consumers. Right? And that's a really important point. When you talk to the FTC in the US and consumer protection agencies elsewhere, Financial privacy and privacy in general is a big, big issue for people. And I don't know that they would appreciate one agency stripping that out of this system. So we can work with our, with our friends. I know that we've been talking to the Senate Committee on uh, Homeland Security and Government Affairs. Gavin and I went to the DC death march and I really appreciate Gavin doing that and uh, I think I owe him many, many beers for having to endure it. Um, but they're looking right now at a holistic approach from top of government down. What agencies should be involved and how should that pie be divided up? So we don't have to necessarily accept right now what, what looks like law enforcement driving this process. And, and again, having things like Constance is talking about, being engaged in those conversations is really important. So let's embrace that and, I, and be thankful that there are people in government who want to not just demonize this technology.